Hi again, uh, we're here today at a, uh, at a new location. So this is Altona, Victoria um, in the southern part of Australia. And we're here to take a look at um, an artillery piece that's at a war memorial here, um, at the local uh, war memorial. Um, if you've been following my channel and seen some of my other videos, you'll know that I've filmed it, filmed at the Australian Armour and Artillery Museum up in uh, Cairns in Queensland, Australia, and also at the Australian Army Tank Museum in Pakapanyol, Victoria. The uh, Australian Army Tank Museum is closed for the next couple of years while they undergo a major renovation. And so I'm looking forward to that reopening uh, somewhere around the end of 2024 with the entire collection moved indoors and, and hopefully better preserved than, um, than it has been in the past. So as I mentioned, what I want to do today is take a look um, here at the War Memorial at um, one of the uh, uh, one of the trophies or, or one of the uh, pieces of artillery that you often see um, at local war memorials here in Australia. And so this is a, um, a of course, a QF 25 pounder gun howitzer, which is one of the major pieces of artillery that was used by British and Commonwealth forces during World War II. I thought it'd be interesting to take a look at this one in particular because this is, of course, an example of the 25 pounder that was produced locally here in Australia. So this gun was originally developed um, by the British during the 1930s and was designed to replace um, two artillery pieces that had been in British service since, since World War I. So the British had, um, had, uh, had always had a, uh, a field gun of about an 18 pounder or an 18 pounder of about 84 millimeters bore that was used for sort of flat firing um, uh, across, um, across the field of battle. And then they had a four and a half inch or 114.3 millimeter um, howitzer that was used for sieges, um, uh, knocking down walls and, and engaging targets at extreme range and lobbing shells in a sort of parabolic um, arc. And so the objective in the 1930s was to combine those two pieces of artillery the 18 pounder field gun and the four and a half inch howitzer into one piece of artillery. And that's what you see before you. This is the 25 pounder, QF 25 pounder gun howitzer that um, was designed by the British to replace those two pieces of artillery and which was widely used during World War II. Um, so in its howitzer mode, uh, so with the uh, gun elevated and um, with the full charge, the gun has a, has a range of over 12 kilometers. So it's quite effective as a, um, as a howitzer. And um, while it was designed with, you know, during the interwar period, and while no one really knew that a war was coming, once it did come and this gun started to see employment with um, British forces, it was recognized that it was quite an effective um, uh, piece of artillery. It was seen that it could combine both the high angle and direct fire capabilities um, of those two original guns. It had a relatively high rate of fire, the shell was relatively lethal, and it was highly mobile. So this piece of artillery in this configuration weighs about 1,600 kilos. It also comes with a uh, with an ammunition carriage um, that weighs um, weighs about the same um, when it's uh, fully loaded with ammunition, and um, and it could be towed around the um, the battlefield quite um, quite effectively. Now, in order to get the um, the, the performance of a um, of a howitzer. The gun actually uses um, two-piece ammunition. So it has the uh, the shell, which is loaded um, into the breech first, normally a high explosive shell. It's designed to go after, um, uh, say, uh, uh, an enemy building or a troop concentration or a soft vehicle. And then behind that shell is loaded the charge. So the charge is normally in a, uh, in a brass canister and in basic configuration had three bags. And by changing the configuration of the bags, adding or removing them, you could get different ranges. So between the angle of the gun and the charge that went in behind the shell, you could get the various ranges that the howitzer was capable of um, firing the gun at. Um, uh, later on, there was, a, there was another charge added supercharge that was used um, in direct fire mode for when this thing was um, shooting at, um, at uh, armored vehicles, and then a supercharge plus that gave an even higher muzzle velocity, again, for engaging um, the armored vehicles, which were getting heavier and heavier throughout the war. So while it was mostly used um, to fire HE rounds, it also did have a solid shot that was used in an armor piercing um, roll, though at, um, at a bore of 87.6 millimeters, that, um, that solid shot had, had quite a big diameter. And it was only later in the war, once a ballistic cap was added to improve the shell's flight characteristics, that, um, that it became a bit more effective. Ultimately though, the anti-tank um, role, um, or the heavy anti-tank role in British service was fulfilled by the, the QF-17 pounder and the 25 pounder was mostly used um, for, um, uh, for infantry support with its um, high explosive shells. Um, so it was mostly used in this towed configuration and in this configuration had a, had a full complement crew of six gunners 
Um, I could have an emergency crew um, that was reduced to four um, for, um, for emergency situations, but basic complement was six, and it was mostly used in this towed configuration. It was mounted to a few um, armoured vehicles throughout the war, so the British first tried to mount it to a uh, Valentine tank chassis to produce the Bishop self-propelled gun. That wasn't very successful, it only saw service in North Africa and um, suffered some reliability issues due to that Valentine chassis, um, and they only produced about 150 of those. Later in the war, however, um, it was mounted onto um, the Canadian versions of the um, M3 and M4 chassis, um, the M M3, M4 mediums, um, Lees and uh, Shermans, um, that were built by the Canadians, and in this configuration was known as the Sexton self-propelled gun. And that Sexton, there was uh, about uh, 2,150 built, um, and it saw employment in uh, Sicily, Italy, and uh, Northwest Europe after the um, invasion of, uh, of Normandy. So it was employed on chassis, and uh, there are some examples of those um, at the Australian Armour and Artillery Museum, um, which we'll take a look at one day. Now, as I mentioned, this version here is the Australian produced version of the 25 pounder. So I was recognized um, in January 1940 that with Australian forces fighting with the British in North Africa, it was necessary for the Australian government to have the capability to supply them with armaments. And Australia didn't have um, a local um, uh, industry that was capable of producing artillery. So the War Cabinet decided that it was time to fund that and to fund an expansion of the um, Commonwealth Munitions Factories and to, um, to get a capability to produce artillery pieces to supply to those Australian forces that were engaged in North Africa and in the Mediterranean. Um, and so this, what you see here, is the result of that, um, that effort. Um, so um, the effort started um, with, the, with a decree by the War Cabinet in uh, January 1940 and they started to engage um, experienced engineering firms in, the, uh, in, uh, in Australia, such as um, Jerome Motors Holden in New South Wales and uh, Vickers Engineering, or sorry, Ruwalt Engineering in uh, Richmond, Victoria, to coordinate the building of these, um, of these guns. And they, um, between them, those two uh, major subcontractors further subcontracted out to about 200 other firms to produce various components. Now, while this doesn't have an engine and looks relatively simple, there's over 5,000 components here, and ultimately they were all localised except for um, except for bearings. Australia never had a capability during the war to produce ball bearings, but everything else was produced locally um, using local materials and um, with uh, small design tweaks made to uh, to accommodate local manufacturing um, capabilities. So the first vehicle that used a combination of a barrel from the government ordnance factory, as well as um, parts from subcontractors, was um, was finished in May 1941. And the first um, gun produced totally from um, uh, privately sourced components, so barrels made privately as well, was in, made in October 1941. And these were being supplied, as I said, to the Australian forces that were in um, in North Africa. Um, so the uh, the effort to produce these guns predates the uh, the involvement of the Japanese in World War II and the um, and, and the fighting that happened in the um, in the Pacific. Of course, um, after Pearl Harbor, um, the need to produce armaments um, locally took on a new urgency and the Australian government redoubled their efforts. And in the end, we produced about um, 1,500 of these um, uh, 25 pound artillery pieces up until uh, 1943. Now with the, um, uh, with the start of the war in the Pacific, it was recognized that one of the main drawbacks of this weapon, unfortunately, um, despite, its, um, despite it being a great package for use in the desert in, in, uh, in Northwest Europe, was the fact that the, the gun by itself weighing 1,600 kilos meant it wasn't really suitable to be um, brought up the kind of muddy mountains and the kind of uh, jungle trails that were um, prevalent in, uh, in New Guinea and in Borneo, where the Australians were doing most of their um, fighting early in the, uh, in the war. So um, uh, Ruwalt Engineering again undertook a major redesign of the gun to produce what was called the short 25-pounder. Um, which was a version of this gun that could be broken down into 14 um, separate parts um, in about two minutes. So starting from a completely assembled gun, you could get to 14 parts in, um, in under two minutes, and you could put those parts um, individually or, or, or lumped together onto Jeeps. You could airdrop them. And I think the heaviest part weighed about 130 kilos. So um, that was still capable of being airdropped and transported on a Jeep, which, um, which had a capacity of about, uh, um, I think about um, 2, uh, 250 kilos. Um, in any respect, um, with that fighting moving, in, in moving to be focused in the Pacific and the jungle warfare, transportability became the major issue for our artillery pieces. So that's why that, uh, that short version of this gun um, was developed. There were other um, artillery pieces available that could fulfill that role, but the, such as the, um, uh, the US 75mm Packhauser, but US Armoured Forces, sorry, US um, uh, 
uh, airborne forces needed that um, that pack artillery for their own purposes. So hence we had to produce about 200 of these short 25 uh, 25 pounders. Um, so let's go and take a bit of a look at the um, at the gun, some of the details, some of the stampings and plates, so you can see um, uh, some of the details of how it was put together. It's a lot of riveted construction. Um, you can see here that's one thing that we could do here in Australia quite effectively. Not a lot of welds in this um, in, in, in the uh, carriage, for example. Um, lots of rivets, which is typical of what you would see for railway um, engineering of uh, engines and carriages, which we could do here in Australia. Here's the plate for the carriage itself. The carriage itself carries a plate from Ruwalt. Um, and while um, the year um, embossing is, um, has been painted over, I think it says 1941, so that's when the carriage was made. Um, going over here to the barrel, you can see the barrel, it says uh, a 25 pounder Mark II CSR company, that's Colonial um, Sugar Refinery, so a sugar refining company that's still in, uh, uh, still in business today. They, um, they did the machining on the jacket. You can see that um, Chubb, who normally makes suit, uh, safes rather, and, um, and still do today, um, make padlocks. Um, they, they did the um, uh, part of the assembly of the, uh, the ordnance or the gun. Um, in 1942. You see the breech has been welding up so that, welded up so that no one can fire off the 25 pounder if they can come up with the uh, the shell and the charge. Um, yeah and there's uh, the siding mechanism um, which has uh, all recently been uh, been repainted. Um, the old uh, wooden seat looking a bit splintery I'm sure that was um, uncomfortable on a um, on some well-worn uh, um, army fatigues for the uh, soldiers who had to uh, had to use it. So um, this configuration here, um, a lot of people would be familiar with the 25 pounder um, having a um, um, having a muzzle brake on the end. That was added later in the war um, for use with the supercharged plus um, uh, charge that was used for the um, uh, the uh, ballistic capped um, armor piercing round. Um, the, the basic 25 pounder didn't need the uh, didn't need the muzzle brake to manage the recoil. You can see the recoil mechanism. We'll head around here to the other side. You can see here the uh, the handbrake. So the um, the uh, uh, carriage here isn't braked; it only has a handbrake to hold it in place. Um, when it's married up with the um, the ammunition trailer, that ammunition trailer had um, had uh, hydraulic brakes, so that would break the uh, the combination of the, um, uh, the the carriage here and the uh, and the ammunition trailer. Um, Probably worth mentioning that after World War II, Australia experimented with putting this gun onto some um, self-propelled. Um, chassis, so we took some of our M3 um, Grants and Lees and cut them open to make like an Australian version of the British Sexton that had this um, 25 pounder um, gun in place. Um, but we only built about 14 of those and they were retired in 1957. The guns saw use after World War II in the Korean conflict with Australian forces. Um, so up in, uh, up in South Korea and um, also during the um, Malaya emergency where Australian forces and, and other Commonwealth forces were fighting communist insurgents in um, the colony of Malaya prior to get in its independence as, um, as the nation of uh, Malaysia. Um, so that's it. Um, interesting example of an artillery piece um, and a it's quite ubiquitous, a ubiquitous artillery piece. Over 12,000 were produced by the end of the war by the British and, and also by Australians and um, used um, uh, during World War II, throughout World War II, um, in, uh, in most theatres, and um, used also by a lot of nations after World War II. So I hope you enjoyed the video, and um, hopefully see you soon with another armoured vehicle or artillery piece. Bye.